And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Science! Science! Yes. I know the human being and science can cause just peacefully. This was their finest. Hey guys, this is Nathan. This is Sean. We're on another episode of Petri Dish, and today we're going to talk about one of the most controversial subjects in human civilization, the origin of life. Now, Sean, where does life come from? When you turn back the wheels of time. If I could turn back. <laughs> Damn, I keep going. Okay. <laughs> For the whole universe, you know, stars unexploding and flickering in and out of existence, you eventually get to the point right before the Big Bang, a point called the singularity, where it's like all of creation, time zero, right before the explosion into the whole universe. And there's this kind of question of what happens right before. It's this mysterious point at the very, very beginning, and biology has its own singularity, its own kind of chicken and the egg situation. I don't agree with your interpretation of the origin of life, but that's okay. What do you got? Well, I mean, God. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you lost like 90% of our audience <laughs> with your whole Big Bang thing. No, people like the Big Bang. Even even people who... I mean, who... I like a Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the Big Bang. Okay, so, so I'm going to just quickly vocalize the fact that for some people, the world started 6,000 years ago and life was created by God in his image. And all the things in the world we were given dominion over. And so all that's created by a sentient design. Okay, but like even, you know, deists or something like yeah. that, like the founding fathers or some Thomas shit. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, would say things about like, oh, God put all these rules in place and then the clockwork universe has sort of taken things from there. But no matter how you look at it, at some point there was a beginning to life and that actually poses an issue in biology. So you're saying that it is possible to simultaneously believe in God and believe in certain scientific theories. <laughs> I, th I think most people go through their lives that way. I think we just solved the crisis at the heart of America now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was that the main thing? <laughs> so, 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 okay, but then what is the origin of life then in biological terms? Right, so there's this thing called cell theory in that all living things are made up of cells and all cells come from other cells dividing, right? Right. But that begs this kind of question of, okay, if all cells come from other cells, that would extend back to infinity, right? But there must have been a beginning somewhere. What came before that very first cell? Ahura Mazda. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, dude, okay. That's, the, that's the Persian deep cut. Yeah. <laughs> Call out to Anna, our favorite Persian friend. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Anna Lee. Married, who yeah, is... married to TJ. Yeah, sure. Originally, yeah. Anna Koresh was her name. God damn it. Okay. <laughs> So th there is this profound idea in biology that all the cells in your body came from one cell that, you know, egg that got fertilized. Right, from right? the sperm that went to the egg. Yeah, and yes. kind of crawled in there and everything. Yeah. Well, but those cells were all from cells in your parents' bodies and back and back and back right. to the original cell. Whatever that original cell was where all, all of the cells on Earth are descended from The that. Edenic cell, the cell of Adam. Yes. Yeah. But what came before it? Woo! That's what we're going to be talking That's about That's the today. chicken and the egg problem. That's the Big Bang singularity issue that we are going to use science to solve forever. Well, we're at least going to talk about it. Okay, cool. So tell me, dude, what are the constituent parts of this theory? What does the audience need to know to dive into it? Yeah, so one of the things people need to know about is something called the central dogma, which... I knew science was a religion. Everyone learned this in high school biology, but having spoken to you about it, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So it's clear that this did not sink in at all. I was, <laughs> I was sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> my biology teacher played Stevie Wonder and danced. Mr. Spinogable uh, was also my biology teacher. <laughs> he changed between the four years that no. we had him. <laughs> he <laughs> was just dancing to superstition the whole time. You technically learned this. The central dogma is that DNA in our cells is what stores the information. 
and then it gets copied into RNA, which transmits the information for how to build proteins. And proteins are the things in your cells that do the work. So that, that's essentially the central dogma is that you have these three things, DNA, RNA, proteins, and they all have their purpose. So in terms of their origin, it's kind of an interesting problem, right? Because DNA and RNA are themselves like polypeptide chains or something, or are they like... Polynucleotide, but yeah. Okay, and so are they technically proteins then as well, or are they just like... They're, they're a whole different polymer. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so they're, they're built out of different building blocks than proteins. Proteins, cool. like Nathan said, are chains of things called peptides or amino acids. So sometimes it's called polypeptides, poly being multiple. So multiple peptides put together. And DNA and RNA are both made up of nucleotides. So that's, that's a whole different building block to make a whole different thing. Okay. So this doesn't seem so hard then. It's just like yeah, in the beginning you had some DNA talking to some RNA making some proteins. What's so hard here? Right. So way, way, way back when. Well, by the way, what are we talking about? Like a billion years ago? Two billion years ago? Three billion years ago? Yes, three billion years ago or so. Okay, shit, so three billion years ago. Yes, when the Earth, you know, was still relatively young, right. you had molecules. There's all kinds of atoms and molecules running around, but DNA, RNA, proteins are really big compared to, like, oxygen right. or water or something like that. And piecing them together by random chance, which is what would have to happen way back when, there's no life around to build these on purpose they would have to be built randomly and you're not gonna build big things by chance so it is god <laughs> uh <laughs> i want to like shout at you <laughs> but there are some people who believe that kind of thing so, like, i can't make people that mad so i guess what i'm saying is that in the very beginning it doesn't seem very likely that there was DNA and RNA and proteins right. all existing already. They're, they're complicated enough of molecules, and their interrelationship is deep enough that for it to just arise in, as that mechanism or that relationship is very unlikely. Right. And so cells themselves are able to make more DNA. They're able to make more RNA and proteins and lipids. So as kind of units of life, cells are able to do all this construction work that non-living stuff, just, you know, a goop of molecules, has a hard time doing. And so at this turning point between a pool of liquid that's not living and the creation of cells that are living, there must have been this transition where you had something that was able to make more of itself and kind of remember how to do it. Okay, sock it to me, bitch. What did that? The DNA? So, uh, you know, that's a good guess because DNA is something that has memory, right? It's what we store our information in. I flipped a three-sided coin, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but DNA is not really capable of doing very much. Okay. So, so one of the things about proteins is that a lot of proteins are something called enzymes. Uh, enzyme is a word for a protein that catalyzes a reaction. So that means that it mm. makes a reaction happen faster. DNA cannot really catalyze reactions. Right. It's like a DNA is like a smart guy in a tower, and then, like, proteins is, like, your dumb fucking dude on the streets who, like, builds his house and isn't literate. Uh, you need that guy in the middle to scribe, right? And that's the RNA. You need the scribe there who might transcribe <laughs> wow. what the DNA does. Wow, look at you, buddy. That was very got, good. I'm a dark horse candidate, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I kind of like it. So you got, you got Mr. Smitey Pants DNA. Mr. Dumb Motherfucker, Strongman <laughs> Enzyme, and then in the middle, you got RNA. Right, and in the central dogma, the way you kind of learn it in high school, RNA, really all it does is be a middleman. But like most middlemen, he's actually waiting to take over top job. <laughs> <laughs> RNA in the central dogma seems kind of like the insurance companies. But they make all the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're yeah. just extracting value with no purpose. Oh, you're such a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the DNA has all this information. Proteins can do all this stuff. We actually have found that some RNA molecules can kind of do both of those things. Mm. RNA can hold information the same way that DNA can, but also are able to catalyze reaction. And these RNA molecules that can do sort of the job of a protein as an enzyme are called ribozymes. Mm. And they currently exist right now. We have ribozymes in our bodies that do a lot of functions. In fact, 
um, ribosomes, which are the main organelle that builds proteins. Yeah. The catalytic units of a ribosome are mostly RNA. So it seems like actually if, if we're going way, way back before we have cells, maybe actually the best candidate molecule that could do all the things that you need to be able to create life originally, maybe the best candidate is actually RNA, that it can store information over generations and be able to do uh, catalytic functions. So three billion years ago, just there's some molecules and shit, and they just kind of like come together, become RNA, and then races are started, you could start to make more RNA? Right, okay, so there are different kinds of ribozymes out there okay and these ribozymes are able to do different functions including things like take pieces of rna and glue them together mm. so you have a chunk of rna where itself it can glue other rna and together. these are called legases <laughs> yeah yeah ligases yeah. <laughs> and then you also have rna that can do things like attach itself to amino acids and that's really important for when we're building proteins now. You know, the point is that maybe RNA could bridge itself into the protein world by attaching itself to proteins and stuff. So, so to get to your, to your question, you know, way, way back when, what would this have looked like? Well, let's right. take a break. And then after the break, we're going to hop right into that. What does this lonely world look like of the little, little RNA? <laughs> okay. My name is Tyler Jerry, and if you like me, you have millions in undeclared assets scattered illegally around the world. You need an accountant who's smart, who's discreet, who's sexy with big arms and strong abs ready to protect your money. You need a man like Lance Jung. He's that kind of fellow, and damn it, he's smooth. You go to a dinner party, you say, Lance, I need your help hiding my money. Ha! The man says, no, that's not what I do. I work at a record company. As if those even still exist. You get a little tipsy now. You say, Lance, really though, I need your help laundering my money. He says, no. You're really drunk now. It's pretty late. You're tipping over the tables. And you say, Lance, really though, they're on to me. I'm gonna end up in a ditch. I need your help fast to hide my money. And damn it, the man pulls through. So if you need an accountant, support our newest Patreon supporter. Hire Lance Jung. Guys, welcome back. We're talking about the origin of life and hop into our time machine. Love Seats with Sean David <laughs> Allen. Woo! <laughs> All the way back to three billion years ago. Sean, it's a hot world. What is it like? So back in the day, the Earth was just getting the shit kicked out of it by meteors. Don't step out of that love seat. It's dangerous. <laughs> and these meteors that were slamming into the Earth could have actually been a source of some of these original organic molecules that we needed. Life is from space? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I think we might have a chance to talk about this sometime in the future, but people... Star children! <laughs> Life on Mars! Uh, people have found... Oh, fuck. Uh, that meteorites oh, and fuck. comets and meteors and everything... Oh, fuck. While they, <laughs> while they don't have, like, aliens and shit crawling on them, oh. or even anything that you'd call a cell, per se... Controversial. ...do seem to have some what are called organic molecules. Dude, I am rock hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes! And it's entirely possible that a lot of our supply of these organic molecules could have come during this intense meteor bombardment that was happening early in uh, the kind of... In Earth's development. Holy shit. Okay, so we're sitting in our love seat. We're watching meteors go by making love. And then some of them carried the, what could be the basis of life on Earth. Yeah, we got a lot of volcanoes erupting. Woo! Right? Volcanic gas is getting sprayed into the air. There's not that much dry land. And uh, what you would have is these little tiny pools of water here and there. So on the little bit of dry land you have, you'd have these pools of water. And... 
kind of depending on what stage exactly of Earth it was. Like, this is so far back. We're not 100% sure what it was like sure. all the time. No one is from then. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, we can't, like, ask old people <laughs> yeah, what yeah. it was like. <laughs> what was World War Two and <laughs> three billion years ago like, grandfather? <laughs> so these pools of water and kind of this the few rocky landscapes that existed could have either gone through freeze and thaw cycles. So that means Mm. it could have gotten cold enough that they froze over and then warm enough that they thawed again, or it could have gone through dry, wet cycles. But either way, this is RNA's home. This would have been one of two places where people think RNA could have existed. The other one is deep sea vents. uh, But that one is kind of becoming a little less popular because one of the things people think is to be able to build up longer RNA molecules, you need to have cycles. Oh, that's that interesting. Cycles where you build and then cycles where you kind of preserve them. And so that's why I'm talking about dry, wet cycles, freeze-thaw cycles. Whereas deep sea vents would be like just kind of continuously hot, sexy action. Right. And so in those situations, you might build some RNA, but you would also break it down pretty quick. I mean, what's even the atmosphere like? Is there like an ozone? Or are we just like getting ass blasted by the sun all the time? Well, so at this time period, because of the volcanic gases, there is an atmosphere. It doesn't have oxygen. It's just like a shitty Venus style atmosphere or something. Well, uh, uh, we have always had a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere. So there's definitely nitrogen there. I have a lot of nitrogen in my nose right now. (laughs) (laughs) What the shit? Whip it. (laughs) 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 Ooh, he's trying. Oh, fuck. Okay. <laughs> the Ooh. atmosphere of my nostril Man, I did not. <laughs> is 100% nitrous oxide right now. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Walked into that one. I, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know that was coming. Okay. <laughs> so we definitely, we had an atmosphere, although there was definitely a lot of UV radiation coming in. Okay. So, so mm. we are getting irradiated. We do have energy from UV. Is getting irradiated, like, good or bad for things? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, because I, I heard of Chernobyl. Yeah. I think it was bad for Ukrainians. Well, and, and also, you know, UV radiation, I think a lot of people are familiar. That's why we wear sunblock and sunscreen. That can cause damage to your cells. I thought Anna just wore sunscreen to be paler for her Korean husband. Oh, we're doing Anna again. Hey. <laughs> Dude, this is Anna's episode. Yeah, listen, Anna, that's two f***ing shout outs in one episode. So you need to not talk to me about that anymore. <laughs> so we're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> UV radiation uh, can damage longer DNA and RNA particles. Sure. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why it's so bad for your skin is that it can actually break your DNA, cause mutations. Right. At our level of complexity, right. you just chopping stuff up can really fuck it up. Right. But that's kind of more when you have a longer molecule anyway. UV radiation can also be a really great source of energy to help build the single building blocks into the longer RNA chains. Which, what does that mean, by the way? Why does energy matter? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons. Um, One of them is on the chemical level, way, way down when we're looking at little tiny molecules. Chemical reactions are two molecules physically hitting each other with enough energy that they form a bond. Okay. So there's a physical car crash situation and UV can sometimes provide a little bit of that energy. Mm. Okay. But also, kind of more importantly, it can knock electrons out Wow, so we're getting real nitty gritty with it. Yeah, right. So you can you can knock electrons out, and that makes it easier sort of for things the, to bond. Right, the atoms more likely to bond because now they're missing an electron. They want to borrow one from somebody else. Fucking Sean Heidegger, Eisenbergian, Sex Schrodinger, right here, dude. Yeah, we're doing it. I guess physics, chemistry, biology. Because remember, biology is just applied chemistry, and chemistry <laughs> is just applied physics. Physics is applied math. And Ooh. math is applied theology. What? <laughs> <laughs> Out of oh nowhere! Oh my god! Whoa! He did it. Yeah, okay, so I'm just a theologian many times removed. We're talking about the origin of life. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. So, like I said, freeze thaw cycles would have been in sort of snowball earth situation, whereas dry wet cycles would have been under the warmer conditions on earth, cool. which. If it was happening, people think it would have been in sort of the 50 to 80 degrees Celsius range, which is like 120 to 175 Fahrenheit. Sure, so dog shit for us, but pretty good for other things. Right, it it would have been, uh, you know, like a a not hot oven. Though the water would have been like a little bit hotter than the hottest shower you've been in, right? 
It would have been just a tiny bit hotter than the inside of that love seat time machine we're in, baby. Uh, yeah, Sean's got steamy. the AC on, baby. What? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't fucking make sense. I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then also, in this kind of rocky environment where you have these little pools that are getting evaporated and then reforming, there could have been clay, mm. which some scientists think clay has sort of this porous structure. It might have helped template the construction of RNA. Ah, so it's kind of like... The clay would have been like a mold that these little individual building blocks would have been falling into, and it, it would kind of like set them up in the right orientation and order to be able to construct these bonds into RNA. That's cool. Yeah. So, so we're in this crazy place. Yeah, and in these little ponds, hypothetically, you have an abundance of these organic molecules, maybe delivered from outer space or maybe constructed from smaller molecules over time. But the idea is you would have a bunch of nucleobases, nucleotides, the things that are the building blocks for RNA. You have a bunch of them kind of hanging around, hitting each other, forming bonds, and making little short RNA molecules. Oof. And all over the place, you know, you have these little ones getting made, and they're getting broken apart. They're degrading, right? So it's kind of this, uh, there's a lot of exploration on what kinds of RNA sequences you're making. Mm. Early 70s. We got Al Green on. We're exploring. <laughs> That's making right. bonds, baby. <laughs> that is right. Polydictad chains, baby. <laughs> so one of the things about RNA and DNA is that uh, you might remember there are these letters. Right. Like A, T, C, G and everything. And these are different building blocks. And you can kind of construct them together to make unique sequences of DNA and RNA. Very cool. And so at this very beginning, you're just mixing, matching. You're making all these different sequences. And most of them don't do anything. And right. they'll fall apart. All right. But some of these could have come together into a sequence that was able to glue other sequences together. Okay, cool. And, and this is a random process. But because it's random over like hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of years, at some point, some of this is going to work out. Right. Eventually, something will come together into sequences that can actually do something. Yeah. It's like you're a tiny, ugly fish in a big dating pond, but at some point you're going to bump into another ugly fish. Just <laughs> right. a matter of time. Especially if it's like not even a pond, it's like a barrel or something. Right, right, right. 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 We're talking like a lot of people shoved in a single clay pond right now. <laughs> right. And once you've successfully made an RNA particle that can reproduce itself it would immediately have a huge advantage over all of these shorter, shittier RNA guys that can't do anything. Because the, the ones that can't do anything will e eventually just break apart. What whereas... does advantage mean to, like, non-sentient molecules? Right. I mean, in a certain sense, it almost means the same thing as when we're talking about selection for evolution. Right. In that anything that can make more of itself will be able to exist in greater numbers than stuff that has to be born kind of randomly. Hmm. So over time, over, you know, quote unquote generations, you would have this RNA making more of itself successfully and other RNA that doesn't do any catalytic function would just kind of sit around and break down. Right. And you can also imagine that some of these RNAs, another kind of ribozyme that we know exists is a ligase. Those glue RNA molecules together. So you can imagine that an RNA could evolve that could glue itself onto other RNA. Maybe, for example, the RNA that can replicate itself. So now you would have an RNA that can make more of itself and then a different RNA, RNA B, that's like a hitchhiker RNA. And it glued itself onto the first RNA. So now it gets made too. Do they feel love? <laughs> do they feel loneliness? <laughs> I imagine it's, <laughs> it'd be like a, do you love the ticks that are feeding on you right now, Nathan? Yeah. <laughs> I am the tick that's feeding on you right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. it's just it's funny because it's so difficult not to anthropomorphize these processes. Like when you say replicate itself, I immediately start to think like, well, that's weird. All of a sudden things are replicating themselves. But I think that's just the trap of anthropomorphizing something that's very not anthropomorphic. Yeah, well, the, it gets to a certain level where you kind of wonder what life means. Right. Which is, I think, where you're coming from, is that that sort of already sounds like it's a living thing. You know, what is life for you, Sean? <laughs> for me, it's just a hot cup of Folgers. 
what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Are you doing a bit right now? Is this an ad? <laughs> you getting paid? Please pay me. <laughs> Folgers. You getting, you getting paid by the big Folgers industry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, big Folgers. <laughs> <laughs> they got to you. Um, <laughs> So the point is that there are certain functions, certain functional pieces of RNA that as soon as they randomly assemble to be able to have that function would immediately confer them a benefit that would mean that they would get expanded. They would replicate so much more than the other RNAs that you'd start to see this proliferation of that function. And at the same time, hey, UVs hitting them and everything, they can start mutating. So this is basically essentially the way that evolution works now. You would have things copying themselves, some of them getting broken by UV radiation, and sometimes those breaks mean that they can't work anymore, and other times it'll mean they work a little bit better. So at what point, though, does any of this shit become like, you know, you said the building block is a cell, everything comes from a cell. At what point, like, how do we make cells? Right, yeah. There's, there's a few really big hurdles to that, okay? And uh, we'll get into those right after a break. My name is Jimmy Coconuts, and if you're like me, you love coconuts! Coconuts, coconuts, coconuts! Well, luckily for you, this Saturday we're doing a sale on coconuts! Yeah. Come down to Jimmy's Orange County Coconut Emporium if you want coconuts! I'm talking 50% off big coconuts, 25% off the little coconuts, I'm talking even 100% off of the biggest coconuts! Whoa. Do you like milk from the coconuts? We got coconut milk! Do you like coconut bikinis? We got babes and coconut bikinis! Do you like cars like the Flintstones going round and round and round and round in coconuts? We got cars made out of coconuts! I tell you, coconuts, coconuts, coconuts! This weekend only, only coconuts! So come on down to Jimmy's Orange County Coconut Emporium! Get all the coconuts, coconuts, coconuts! Guys, we're back where we left off. RNA is getting hit by crazy light outside a beautiful time machine in clay ponds. Patrick Swayze making pots. Yep. All of a sudden, we've got RNA trying to make more of itself, replicating. But when does this RNA turn into the cell that we know? Right. So there's kind of two main hurdles here. One of them is that we need to build the actual cell part, which has this membrane made out of phospholipids. The fuck is a phospholipid? <laughs> yeah. So uh, lipids are fat molecules. Mm. Okay. So like olive oil or Crisco or whatever. Yeah, or okay. like people. <laughs> fat, <laughs> yeah. fat, decadent people. <laughs> so these fat molecules and phospholipids have another group attached onto the fat molecule. Okay. In the case of phospholipids, it's a phosphate group. Right. But the main point why that's useful or important is that Fat molecules dislike being around water, okay? So that's one of the reasons why, like, oil droplets will separate from water, right? And then this head group that we attach on, the phosphate, likes water. It's hydrophilic, okay? And so having those two things put together means that if you toss a phospholipid or a bunch of phospholipids into water, they will automatically form into shapes to hide the lipid part and to stick the head group part out toward the water. Right. So a lot of times they form little spheres with all the lipids inside and all the phosphate groups outside. Those are called micelles. And other times they'll form sort of like bubbles. My cell just sounds like an app or something like my cell. <laughs> it's like you monitor your own cell. It's like your little baby cell, like a oh, chia pet or something. Okay, okay. You're talking about like like you know cells in your body. Yeah. yeah. I, I went every other way with that. I thought you were talking about like your <laughs> prison cell. I was about to say your prison cell. <laughs> um, and then yeah. uh, adopt a prisoner today. I also thought it was maybe like you monitoring or like sponsoring an incel. <laughs> so, oh, no. so it's like an app for like my cell. So you can like you can watch the incel cell in your life kind yeah. of thing. Uh, <laughs> these, these might all end up as sponsors someday. It's like an Elliot Smith song. It's like a, like a camera in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Elliot Smith. <laughs> I do too. Uh, I miss him. Yeah, R.I.P. <laughs> a lot of dead people in the spot. Oh, uh, shit. Okay. Fuck. We, we got way off the beaten path on this one. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about how fat people oh, join no, together. Yeah. My cells. Okay. And, and in other cases, these phospholipids, when you toss them in, can form membranes kind of like bubbles, where the outside is water, the inside is water, but there's this kind of thin layer 
of two sets of phospholipids kind of with the fat in the middle and then kind of the phospholipids on the outside. Why would they form in a way where there just happens to be a lot of RNA in the middle? Right. Okay. So this can happen essentially spontaneously. So if, if the water is as hot as we're talking about here. It's like 122 to 172. Right. So we're talking hot water, hotter than a shower you want to take. Okay. At that temperature, a lot of phospholipids will form these bubbles, but they won't be super stable. Okay. So holes will occasionally open up in the bubble. Things can move in and out. And sometimes they'll just break apart and reform. Okay. So it's kind of a more chaotic situation. And so the idea is you might have circumstances where you sort of trap some RNA on the inside. But really, the only reason why the RNA can maybe get in there at some point, and then if it gets long enough, has a hard time getting back out, is the idea. Hmm. So, you know... You so RNA is trapped inside phospholipids by random occurrence. Right. And, you know, in, in all of these scenarios, the idea is that there's a pretty high concentration of this stuff happening in these little ponds. Right. right? So it's kind of this intense environment where you have a bunch of these little bubbles forming and breaking apart and getting holes popped in them and everything and then sometimes rna will kind of get in there maybe it'll make itself too big and then now it can't really escape again there's other kinds of ideas but one of the main things about membranes is that usually some things can pass through and then other things can't it's called being semi-permeable and that's true for our cell membranes also right and so the idea would be the building blocks for rna would be able to slip back and forth across the border wall. That's cool. Like coyotes. Oh, <laughs> so political. <laughs> no, but so, under some circumstances, they could get formed into a larger RNA molecule that can't escape anymore. And so you'll gradually build up more and more RNA inside of these bubbles. Okay. Because the bigger ones can't get out, but the smaller ones can keep coming in. Okay. So that's, that's one way that you can make what are called protocells. In that they have this membrane the same as our cells. And there's some RNA in there. Doing and there's some thing. RNA in there that can build up its concentration. Now. So how do you go from protocell to like now o cells? <laughs> how do you get the cell cells? Yeah. So there's one kind of final bit about protocells and then a whole other issue. Okay. The final bit about protocells is that our cells nowadays divide. That's an important function of cells is that they can split and you know kind of continue on producing all the cells in your body whereas three billion years ago it's kind of like you have a phospholipid bilayer you've got rna in there they're not necessarily like doing meiosis or anything right yeah or they're, mitosis they're, right, either way yeah, yeah they're they're not doing the really complicated cell division we're doing now right um because they don't have all of the crazy proteins and shit that's required to do that right but what they have found is that if you do have a chaotic enough environment with a lot of lipids, phospholipids hanging around in the environment, as the RNA collects inside and kind of starts to build up pressure, like you have too much RNA jammed in there, right? And the phospholipid membrane is just like kind of straining to hold it all in. <laughs> phospholipids will naturally start to come in to help increase the size of that membrane. Because mm. as you're kind of straining it, you're making these little gaps for new phospholipids to come in. So you can actually grow one of these membranes just by shoving too much shit inside. I like it. It's a fuck cell. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an erotic episode. And then eventually, if these guys get too big, random heat fluctuations could cause them to tear apart into smaller cells. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. So you could actually have division here without all the complicated machinery that our cells use just by tearing the really, really big protocells into smaller ones. There's like a magnetic quality to these protocells, and then they get too large, they split off. Right. They can kind of draw stuff in over time as the RNA inside keeps forcing them to need to be bigger, right? So that's the protocell side. But... For us to get to life now, there is one really, really big jump that's missing. Where the fuck's the DNA? Well, the yeah. DNA is actually easy. <laughs> oh, oh, it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the DNA is easy because DNA and RNA are made up of almost the same building blocks. Oh, okay. So eventually, at some point, some RNA... Got real twisty with it. <laughs> some RNA figured out that it could copy itself with slightly different 
off-brand Lego pieces. Ooh, I like it. Generic <laughs> Lego pieces. Yeah, like Lego pieces that have like glue in them yeah, or something. Yeah, like legumes or something. <laughs> so they stick better, right? And so some RNA figured out like, oh, I can make a more stable copy of myself. So who's anthropomorphizing uh, random <laughs> molecules now, huh? <laughs> it's just so easy to do. Do they feel love? <laughs> So this very clever inventor RNA yeah, at yeah. some point figured out that it could make a more stable copy of itself with slightly different building blocks called DNA. But that could have happened later. Okay. The bigger jump is proteins. Because proteins are made up of a completely different building block. How did they start associating themselves with RNA? The genetic code that gets us from a piece of RNA into a full-fledged protein, this genetic code that's conserved among all of life, bacteria all the way up to humans, we have the same genetic code. This must have evolved way, way back when for this original protocell to cell jump. Okay? So this goes all the way back to the origins of life. How? How did something like RNA, which it could maybe replicate itself, but proteins don't really replicate themselves. But you need proteins to do all sorts of advanced chemical reactions that can right. make a proper cell possible. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, what, what was this jump? Okay. What was it? <laughs> I think it was Genesis. <laughs> it was the Old Testament. <laughs> yes. This is where Jesus comes in. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right. Then a Jewish guy wrote a book. <laughs> and all the cells, oh, uh, heed, heed the word of God. <laughs> and then made cell cells. Okay. So, this is a point where it's speculation. Okay. I mean, I mean so all, all, all of this, this is kind of speculation. Yeah, all of this is technically hypothetical, but ribozymes do exist. Right. We have found RNA molecules that can do a lot of the things that I'm describing. Sure. So this, this theory is all supported by good stuff, by the good primo science. Right. It can still get changed. This is still very much in the investigation point. But this next jump is the part where it really gets more speculative because we have not seen anything like this happen when we just mix molecules together. It's a question of this original association. And what it might be is that the small building blocks of proteins, amino acids, were also there in the soup. And there's enough energy that the amino acids could have started coming together into very short peptides. Not proteins. Proteins have thousands of peptides put together. This would have just been a few, you know, two to three, before they would start breaking down back into amino acids. But maybe some of them were useful to the RNA. Maybe some of them, because proteins and peptides all have their own unique chemistries involved, and we don't actually know how small a chunk of a protein can be catalytically active. So it could just be like four or five little amino acids put together could have a catalytic effect. And it's possible that some entrepreneurial RNA mm. was kind of sitting around, and it found that whenever this one peptide got close to it, its reactions got a lot faster. That there became an advantage for RNAs that could collect certain peptides nearby them. How the fuck do you collect a peptide? Maybe by forming a chemical bond with it. Ooh. Which is one of the fundamental parts of how we get from RNA to proteins in our cells is something called tRNA, which is an RNA molecule attached to an amino acid by a covalent bond. That is essential for us to be able to build proteins. So, so like early RNA is like pimps, and the way that you get a bottom bitch and all your hoes <laughs> is is you fuck them, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right, though, are, right? Are we, <laughs> oh shit! I'm just trying to make it accessible. <laughs> <laughs> Our audience knows <laughs> a lot about Pimp's nose. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I tried so hard with this. Hey, episode. shout out to Kenny Din. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's gonna, that's controversial. Anna's gonna get mad about that. Uh, anyway, okay. Okay. Um,. What what point were you trying to make when you started talking about pimp? I'm just host? explaining that, that RNA and pep. It's like uh, the RNA is the pimp, and it sees some like fine ass peptide hose, and it's like if I fuck that, make a chemical bond, a covalent bond with this whole ass peptide, I'm gonna keep it in my circle, and it's gonna be my bottom bitch. Oh my god. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, yes. Let's go with yes. That's precisely what's happening. Is that originally it might have been a situation where. 
RNA trying to do a certain function found that having some peptides nearby was useful, eventually evolved the ability to covalently attach to that peptide, and then one day evolved the ability to make that peptide itself. But okay, wow. So that's crazy, man. So like, at and this is all kind of speculative. Yes. But some RNA just like took on some peptides and then right. made that shit work. Right. That these peptides were being useful. And so the RNA, which has at this point the ability to replicate itself and evolve, evolved randomly in a way that made it so they could attach to the useful peptides. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that could became very popular. And so expanded themselves. Okay, I got... Here's another one that maybe we'll keep. So the RNA is like a wealthy woman with some Chardonnay, and the peptide is just like a lawn boy. And she's like, I'm going to take up this guy's good DNA. <laughs> Make some more of me. <laughs> and then they fuck. <laughs> I got to say, this one I think works better. I, I think I stand by pimps and hugs. <laughs> so, so we have our cell, our protocell, and at some point RNA figured out how to do the, the good jizz with the proteins. <laughs> and, and, and then it's not that hard to become DNA. And boom, we got our cell with the phospholipid bilayer, our RNA, who somehow becomes middle bitch. I don't know how that happened. Uh, DNA and uh, proteins. Right. So once you get to the point where you have some kind of nucleic acid like DNA and RNA having the code that can make proteins. Proteins are very, very good at enzymatic reactions. So they probably displaced a lot of the original ribozymes by Damn. just being more efficient. So over time, now we don't have that many ribozymes anymore. We have some, but not that many. And a lot of that's probably stuff that's been taken up in the protein side so that they've taken on those responsibilities because they're so good at it. Uh, and then, you know, the Bob's your uncle, dude. That's that's how you get the cells. You, you, you take the RNA up to lazy acres. Yeah, you yeah. put them out to pasture. Yeah. <laughs> you turn them into glue. You tell the DNA, it's like, <laughs> what happened to the RNA? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, don't worry about them. They're safe. Right, yeah. So, you know, the, essentially RNA functioned on both sides, the sort of information side and the construction side, but maybe wasn't as good on either one. And mm. so once it gave spawn to the ability to make proteins... Sure, once we specialized. Right. Then those guys took those functions and RNA kind of just slipped into this middle ground. Damn, dude. So that's three billion years ago. Fast forward three billion years. Here we are recording on a mic. But all our cells ultimately come from that moment when an asteroid hit the Earth and love thus sprang in the clay ponds. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of different theories about how much stuff might have come with those meteors, right? Some people are like, maybe maybe whole cells yeah. were delivered on the meteor. But even if whole cells got delivered on the meteors, it still begs the question, where did those cells come from originally, right? And somewhere down the line, the RNA world hypothesis is kind of one of the best ones we have right now for how original cells were formed. All the shit we just talked about is the RNA world hypothesis. Right. Okay, cool. Because that's a sexy name. Yep, the RNA world hypothesis. Okay, guys, well, thus, Sprach Zarathusa. Okay. We have excavated and illuminated the origin of life. Maybe true. Maybe it's the bi- I don't know, I don't know. I don't want to be controversial. <laughs> but, Sean, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, you know, one of the things you said earlier was about this tendency toward uh, anthropomorphizing these little RNA guys running around doing their thing. And I think it's very true because uh, there is something very lifelike about that very original ability to replicate yourself and to kind of pass on this information. And in a certain sense, it's chemistry. It's stuff banging together and making larger molecules and everything. There's stuff out there that can kind of grow, like crystals can grow. Right. But... They don't do quite what RNA does in that it can make copies of itself and then mutate. It can evolve and gain new abilities and change it over time and maintain those changes, maintain sort of that history of what it was. And that probably is something fundamental to life. Right. It, it's really history and memory. Right. That continuity that gives life its meaning and its uniqueness. Therefore, the capacity to change. So my history degree is more important. 
Yeah. Than your various degrees in science. You are life. (laughs) I am life. Yeah, I studied life science. You studied just life. Ah, dude. Thank you. I needed that. You're very beautiful. (laughs) Well, guys, please patronize me and my historical poverty. Uh Uh, Sign up for Patreon. We're going to drop all sorts of nerdy, nerdy, goofy, pervert content on there. Yeah, patreon.com slash petri dish. We're going to start doing little collections of the fake ads that we've been doing, along with a lot of naughtier things that I don't feel comfortable broadcasting in the actual episode. It's a, it, I've lost that battle, <laughs> so we're going to throw it online. Uh, we should thank Stacy, our sound lord and producer. Who is beautifully putting on makeup this entire episode. She Good. looks great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian Allen, who did the artwork that you can see on our Patreon and that will eventually grace the hats and mugs that we'll be giving out. And He's the do. origin of our life. Yeah, yeah, he was he was the His spermsicle. Seed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is accurate. And otherwise, thank you guys for listening. Good night and good luck. <laughs> yeah, bye everyone. <laughs>